asked me to put together a slide presentation on the future of energy, and I, I did that, and so if there's going to be a website or some kind of a place where people are going to come and see slides, the slides are there, right? The slides will be there, the students can post them afterwards. But I'm not going to use them, because as you guys saw, I walked in when you were listening to Elizabeth Gilbert, and I thought, you know what? I'm going to give a totally different talk. Right, uh, because responding to what she said and, and the subsequent presentation, because that's really what a university is about, is trying to inspire you and capture your imagination on how to be creative in many different fields. Right, and the reason a university like Rice has so many different departments and so many different things for you to do is that we don't know what area of science, what area of literature, what area of the arts, what area of public policy is going to strike a chord with you. And that's what makes a great university, is having everything here so that something can strike a chord with you. So I want to tell you guys a story. Uh, and if I tell this story and one person uh, comes away with the story and it strikes a chord, then I will have been successful. So several years ago, uh, I, we have a joint venture research project. We look at the geopolitics of oil, which is you know, a very important topic today, uh, given the possibility of war in the Middle East and, and other things that might cut off our supply. And uh, we have a joint venture with a think tank in Japan. And so I go to Japan a lot. And uh, because it's such a long flight, I always bring someone with me. I'm always going around, will you come with me to Japan? Will you come with me to Japan? And I'm always trying to grab someone to come with me to Japan. And of course, every time I finally convince someone to come with me to Japan so I can stay an extra two days, so I have to turn around and fly 18 hours back, um, I have to take them to Kyoto. So one time, I brought my best friend from high school and college with me. Uh, and she went sightseeing when I was having my academic meetings. And then we went to Kyoto. And we went to uh, a Buddhist uh, garden slash monastery called uh, Ruanji. And every time I go there, I notice something different. And this time, as I was walking around there, I noticed that everything was in pairs. If I saw a butterfly, I saw two butterflies. If I saw uh, a little bud coming out of a tree that hadn't bloomed yet, I saw two buds. If I noticed a beautiful shrub that was like a triangle, I noticed two of them. And what I took from that experience in sort of a spiritual kind of way is that in my life, I was focusing on too many things at once. And if I was here with you, I was thinking about what I'm going to have for dinner, right? And if I was having dinner, I was worried about the thing, the presentation that I had to get together after dinner for my morning. And that what I took away from this particular visit to Rwanji was that I have to focus in on the person I'm with, the project I'm working on, whatever I'm doing, I have to focus on that at that moment. So I'm telling you, this story is going to come back to energy, I promise. Okay? And the interesting thing about Rwanji and, and doing something like walking around, you know, one of the most beautiful gardens in the world, is that every individual takes something different. And so after about 45 minutes of walking around this garden with this friend of mine, I said to her, isn't that amazing how everything we're seeing is in doubles? It's all in two, like incredible similar twos. And she hadn't noticed that at all. She said, I don't understand. What are you talking about? And we're walking right next to each other. So years pass, and I'm late for a conference in this very room. And it's a conference celebrating the birthday party of Dr. Neil Lane, who does the science and technology policy program at the Baker Institute. And I'm coming specifically for the energy panel, and I am not speaking. I have arranged for Dr. Richard Smalley, who was the head of the Nanotechnology Center here at Rice, to give the energy speech. And I hadn't seen Rick for a couple of weeks, and we had kept working on this whole question of the intersection between energy policy and energy science, and uh, we had both been traveling, and I, you know, I'm sort of running because I'm late, and I look out on the front lawn of Rice. You know, I'm parking at Cohen House, which I'm not even supposed to be doing, right? Because I can't even have time to go to my parking space. And I see these young Japanese students, and they have a camera. And they're taking a picture of something on the front lawn. 
And the picture they're taking is of two perfectly similar mushrooms that have grown on the front lawn of rice. Two exact mushrooms, exactly the same size in the center of the front lawn. And I thought, that is so bizarre. That's like Ruanji. And I wouldn't even have noticed it, but there were Japanese students taking a picture. That's doubly weird. <laughs> and so I get to the auditorium, you know, now in this sort of totally different frame of mind than I would normally be to listen to a talk. And Richard Smalley gave, stood up and gave the most interesting talk I'd ever seen in 30 years on energy, which wasn't his field. And I'll tell you what he said after I tell you the punchline of the story, right? Because the punchline of the story maybe is actually more important than what he said, though what he said was also important. The punchline of the story is he was on a panel with five experts in energy. I mean, people who've done energy all their life, famous scientists who've done energy all their life. And I've done energy all my life, you know, but not as a scientist, but as a person looking at the policy of what would work. And these people were all civic scientists. They were people who were either in the White House on energy, or they were the one time the Deputy Secretary of Energy or Secretary of Energy or something like that. And when we got to the end of Dr. Smalley's speech, which was the most brilliant thing I've ever heard on energy ever. The audience clapped for everybody, and then they had Q&A. And for 20 minutes of Q&A, nobody asked Richard Smalley a single question. In fact, they acted like the guy was so out of the loop that his talk was like, he doesn't get it. He's not an energy expert like us. He doesn't understand why what he's saying isn't what we're all talking about. Right? And they completely dismissed it. Completely dismissed it. And you could tell from the atmosphere of all the other energy scientists and scientists in the room that they were sort of thinking to themselves, geez, what a shame that they didn't have an energy expert give that talk. Do you know what I mean? Like, there was this sort of arrogance about it that he just doesn't know what he's talking about. But over time, people came around to the point where what he said became common, the common idea. And that is because his idea was so brilliant and so correct that no one could accept it upon hearing it. And to me, it's a fundamental thing about science, right? And solutions, policy solutions. When you first hear it, everybody's saying the same thing, saying the same thing, saying the same thing, saying the same thing. So if somebody who's either more brilliant than everybody else or put a clean pair of eyes on the same problem comes up with the same, a totally different solution, the first impulse of everybody else who's been working in this area for three decades is to say they're wrong or to just block it out. And I'm telling you all that story so that if someday you are working on something and you have what you think is the right solution, the first time you present it, if you don't get a big ovation like you're thinking in your head, that doesn't mean it's wrong. It could be that you have the Richard Smalley solution and it's just you have to have the stick new it is with to know that you have analyzed this and you've analyzed it correctly and you have to stick with what you're thinking, right? And it was a really instructive experience for me, not being a science person, to know so much about energy, to know that, know that he was right. I mean, he was clearly right. And to have this room filled with energy experts and no one understood how right he was. So I'll tell you what he used to say. He used to say that the energy problem is a fundamental thing and that if you took the list of the world's 10 greatest problems and you thought about if I could only solve one of these, which one would I do first, right? And he used to say we need to do energy first because if we solved energy, many of these other problems down the list could be solved. For example, Many of you probably study things like clean water and the scarcity of water. Well, you know what? The reason we have scarcity of water is because we can't drink ocean water. We can't use ocean water for agriculture. We can't do that, right, because of the nature of that water. But we can desalinate ocean water into pure water. But it costs a lot of money. Why? Because the electricity to convert ocean water into pure water is very expensive. 
right? So again, if we had some kind of fuel or some solution where electricity was virtually free or was one penny per kilowatt hour, the water problem would be solved. Maybe even with food. Because if we could greenhouse food, why is it, you know, it's too expensive to greenhouse food, why? Because of the cost of electricity, right? Climate change, problem could be solved if we had a clean and incredibly affordable energy. Poverty, right? I mean, think about what is the thing that happens to most people in the world? They have no access to fuel or electricity. And if you think about your lives, and you would think about yourself as a young person living in sub-Saharan Africa, you don't have the luxury to go to school. You have to go out and collect firewood or other kinds of materials to use for heat and light in the evening to cook. You can't go anywhere at long distance because you don't have access to fuel for a vehicle. Any work you do that's farming or agricultural, you don't have fuel to use a machine. So you have to do it by hand, right? And if you never get access to electricity or fuel, you're never going to get to the next generation being more successful than the generation before it. So this issue of the energy problem is just could dramatically change the world if someone could come up with the solution. And Dr. Smalley had this really brilliant insight, right? Because everybody who works on energy, they're trying to come up with something big, you know, like a nuclear plant that would supply enough electricity for an entire city or um, or a, a, a something to back up a wind farm, right? Or, or uh, things on a large scale. But if we reduce the problem down to, I need enough electricity to operate my home or a building, then the whole puzzle of electricity storage becomes incredibly easier to solve, right? So if I don't have to come up with electricity storage or fuel storage for the city of Houston, but I just need to do it for everybody's individual home, you know, then you're talking about I have to create a device that's the size of a washing machine. And how would I generate, that would store electricity, and how could I generate the electricity that would go in it? Then a lot of things become possible. I could have my rooftop solar. I could provide electricity on days it was sunny and stored in my little thing that's the size of my washing machine. I could plug my car into it. If my car generated electricity when I drove it, I could then transfer the electricity into my home storage thing and use it at night. If I was going on a trip, I could take my trip in my car and then use my car to recharge my home storage unit. So when he broke it down to this issue of distributed energy, that was like the key to the puzzle, right? Then I don't have to come up with a technology that provides a giant amount of energy that replaces an oil field in Saudi Arabia all in one machine. I, I just have to come down to something on a small scale, and then I need to get people to think about their energy use and solution in a small scale. And, and I really think that that's going to be the key. If we think about computing, and we're, I mean, I don't know how many of you have, are in computing, but I know my brother uh, studied computing, uh, well, I guess it would have been 40 years ago. And there was a building the size of Duncan Hall where he would go, that was the size of the computer, and he would program these cards to do computing. He would, have a, a, he would have to come up with a question, and then he would have to get the cards punched in the right way and feed them into this giant machine to answer a question that you kids can do on your telephone, right? So for the energy puzzle, I think Dr. Smalley really had the right point, which is that distributed energy is going to be the solution of the future. It is not OK, the system we have now, where uh, a third of the world's planet has no access to fuel at all. Two thirds of the world's planet has no access to, to modern and reliable electricity. It's not acceptable. Right? And he also had the right idea, which is that it's your generation. You're more oriented to understanding the problem of climate change. You're more able and willing and trained to think outside the box in terms of technologies and computing. Right? And, and someone in this room, someone in this room could be the person who comes up with the solution to a distributed energy system. 
And that's our hope, that someday I'll be able to turn around and the speech I'm going to give is about how a student from Rice or some other you know, person who, young, your age, came up with this solution, right? And they had a out-of-the-box idea about how to fix the energy system in a way that brought energy to all people and did not just take something out of the ground in one country and allow those people to be very rich at the detriment to, you know, many, many millions and millions of people in, across many countries. So that's what I leave you with. That wasn't what was on my slides. If you're interested in U.S. energy policy and where we're going, though that's on my slides, that'll be for a different day. Thank you very much. <laughs>